All right. These are my office hours on Tuesday, July 5th, 2022. I'm going to share screen for a second. The topic for uh, this, this office hour is creating uh, an OGM slash relate vision video. And I, I fear this may be a, a an inconsequential fear, but I fear that I'm stuck in some of the regular ruts that I've that I've been using uh, for a while to explain why OGM exists, why Relate exists, and one of those is that uh, <clears throat> we're sort of in a in a in a time when we're being spun, and uh, I'm not even saying it as well as I just said it. That's too bad. How did I start it? How did I start it a moment ago? <laughs> I know you can help me. Um, it was a dark and stormy night. No, that's not what I did. It was about the polarity. I remember that. Yeah. So, so we're kind of in this polarized world where um, we're uh, we're in a, in a huge Mexican standoff uh, that keeps us from governing our country properly. And in fact, we're sort of approaching minority rule. There's this whole dark scenario I paint about how democracy might be ending, and and uh, in the meantime, we have these climate crises and other crises facing us that we're unable. Uh, to actually deal with because we're so so messed messed up dealing with other stuff that that is a uh, uh, in some sense a time waster and in another sense just crucial um, and so building a shared memory and being open to other people who have different opinions is a way of bridging the cultural divides is a way of maybe uh, getting someplace where we could make uh, more rational decisions together and start to govern again uh, as a community, as as people who are interdependent, and and so that's kind of a negative path into the into why this exists, and and because it's that negative and also political, I kind of try to avoid it. But then there's this piece about okay, once you start talking about building a shared memory, there's this very positive piece, which is I think where the vision video wants to go which is, hey, if this thing works, if we wind up getting a shared memory, we have these contagion effects into education, journalism, science, elections, politics, governance, uh, and probably other fields that, that are right next door to those things. And, and I can talk about that. I could, I could basically illustrate, um, okay, how, how, how might this uh, change education? Well, uh, and then, you know, lots of different places to go there, but, but what if, what if this, the assets that students were creating were more durable for them personally, but then the best of those assets actually became part of the shared assets like the Wikipedia? Uh, and here the Wikipedia is the example I have to hold up all the time. Please jump in. Yeah, first off, if we, I mean, if you could explain how by unraveling that ball of yarn, you wouldn't have to throw out the whole ball just because you didn't agree with it. You'd be able to find the pieces that you could take from it and use. It does no, you're not. I think which which ball of yarn are you referring to? The the tangled well, political mess I just re referred to, or yes. just the yes. issues on deck? Well, yeah. you're saying you want to be able to find a positive spin, right? Well, a, a, a shine a positive light on this. I don't even know that or I want to say a positive, a positive spin. Light. I think there's so there's different ways to explain the situation. Some of which are really dark. Some of which are much lighter. Right, because but like sometimes what I'm saying, so the positive light on it, though, is that things may not really be as polarized as they appear because we're 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 seeing the extremes on the outside. Like we're not hearing the moderates mm -hmm. on the inside. But if we were able to unravel things, like even in our group of people that we love, Mm -hmm. If we dug deep enough, we would find disagreement because we trust each other. We lean into it and we're able to get through it and take pieces and leave pieces. But that doesn't happen in the bigger world. But if we were able to break apart some of those ideas, not throw them all out mm -hmm. when we don't agree with something, we'd be able, like you're always saying, we'd be able to share the things that work for us and then move on to something else like it i'm not finding the right words mm -hmm. i think i'm capturing some of it here in the bullets yeah i think so um i like that and um 
And there's just a whole bunch of observations and assumptions behind this argument or this conversation, because uh, part of it is that the internet as a medium seems to turbocharge extreme voices. It seems to favor them. It seems to make them louder. It spreads them faster, all that kind of stuff. So we end up thinking, oh my gosh, all the world is extremists and we must be going down the tubes because wow, look at look at all this vitriol. Uh, when in fact, people who are in the middle are A, discouraged from participating, uh, B, not that motivated to share out what they know or think or say because it's not that extreme. It doesn't, you know, it, it won't attract clicks or whatever, but, and so forth. Or or it's happening. It's just happening in some quiet corner of the internet where important conversations are happening and it's not going viral or anything like that, right? So the, the, that's a nice, uh, a nice set of, of thoughts here. Um, and and let me go back to the brain here for a sec. <clears throat> so I'm uh, I have a whole thought called Tech Utopian Videos and Demos, uh, one of which is the Apple Knowledge Navigator video from 1987. And I, I think I've mentioned it a couple of times. Have you ever seen it? I think you sent it to me once. I think I did watch it. Oh, cool. And it's it's got kind of like an on-screen assistant who's trying to be helpful to somebody who's doing research and this and that. And in retrospect, it ain't bad. Like. I have a voice recognition assistant at home that called the Google Assistant that will, in fact, go research stuff and answer questions for me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I have a highly evolved, you know, visual interface and little magic devices that didn't exist in anybody's head in 1987. I mean, you know, 87, 87 is pretty aggressive for 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 all this kind of vision. So I'm I'm kind of inspired by that. Um, and then this, this uh, somewhere on the line, this quote from the Little Prince showed up, um, which is interesting because I think this I think this came up in one of our OGM calls, like the build OGM calls or the check-in calls, where the quote from Little Prince is: "To build a ship is not to weave the canvas, force the nails, read the stars, but rather to give the flavor of the sea, in the light of which there is no longer anything contradictory, but rather community and love." which is lovely. Um, I think it's partly the, I think the quote is also, or there's either another quote or this one gets misinterpreted to, you just have to teach people to love the sea. Um, and so there's a piece of that. Um, and as, as we were talking about building OGM, I had written this note, two paths ahead for building OGM. One is create a vision and then start to create architectural scaffolding. So others can come and add things. And this should actually be um, connected to potential OGM architecture components because I have a nice long list <clears throat> up here of geeky software and other so so sorts of platforms that might fit into a solution. Um, so that's kind of what that is. So what else comes to mind? Um, and, and just while I'm talking, I think you saw the video I, I did earlier, which was just like uh, painting with words, but talking about the relate use cases of, hey, uh, a book is just a playlist, uh, a PowerPoint deck is just a playlist. What if we can rev on the nuggets and improve the nuggets and all that kind of stuff? Let me go here to PowerPoint killers. Um, what up? Playlists, books and presentations are playlists. That's the thought I'm looking for. So this can go to PowerPoint killers. This can now connect to the relate use cases, which is where I said that. And then I can't actually read what that says. Um, let me go back to PowerPoint killers. And here's Markdown presentation apps, HTML5 presentation apps. And this can go there. Okay. Um, 
And that seems like too geeky a starting point for a vision video, but I like it. I like that. I like this video that I created because for me, it was very tangible. I was describing something that was easy to see uh, and something that some people might actually like to use. Huh. So I'll connect it up to our relate vision video thing here. Oh, I've already got the relate use cases down below. So let's put this up here and then they're both connected. Okay. Um, there's also a bunch of other Tech Utopian videos and demos, not all of which are very good. Uh, some of which inspired a whole ton of people. Um, are you familiar with Engelbart's 1968 demo? No. no. So, so this one um, is worth watching a little piece of it, just so you're um, a little familiar with it. So I will send you a link to this. Okay. I think this video should still be around. Copy. Um, I'll put it in the chat here for now, and then we I'll, I can copy paste those somewhere else later. So, <clears throat> there we go. I can do it. Um, but it's um, it's pretty amazing because in black and white on little TVs in 1968, uh, this guy Doug Engelbart basically patiently shows a way for collaboration to happen with really early computers where just having images, everything we take for granted right now, I have a little mouse cursor that, you know, that my little arrow moving around on screen, he invents for that demo. Mm -hmm. The idea of a window, uh, I, I, I'm, I have, I'm seeing you in a little zoom window, I've got my brain in a window, I've got uh, obsidian in a window, the idea of windows overlapping on screen, I'm not sure his overlapped, but the idea of windows on screen comes from his demo. Uh, the idea of time sharing so that multiple people can edit a document, that's in his demo. It's, it's shocking the number of things he, uh, he demonstrated in 1968 that nobody was thinking about, or practically nobody. Um, so what I'm hoping uh, is, oh, good. is to tie into some of that energy. I just realized, I just located another thought I had in my brain, which is uh, precursors to the internet and the web. Uh, and then I, I made a collection that's overlapping with the, the, the tech utopian video thing we just saw. But this one is basically visions that have inspired builders of global brains. And uh, here there is uh, tile, the philosopher Teilhard de Chardin's idea of the noosphere. That's inspired a bunch of people. Uh, there's Ted Nelson's book, Computer Lib Dream Machines from 1974 before Engelbart. And Nelson's one of those sort of visionaries. Uh, this motivated a lot of people. Uh, there is the Memex, which is Vannevar Bush's idea of a, of a memory searching device that would be like a desk with microfilm in it because that's what he had at World War II era was microfilm. Uh, there is the rhizome, which comes out of Guattari and Deleuze philosophers in their book, A Thousand Plateaus, Mille Um, So these are all, and then there's Indra's net, which comes out of Hindu philosophy. Uh, the Wayan school uh, of Mahayana Buddhism, which has uh, this net of pearls uh, that are um, insights, I think. I'm, I'm, I'm not able to sort of load more of what I remember about this. But uh, there's a whole, I mean, like, like this, this vision goes way back into um, Hindu civilization and Buddhism. So, so all these things are kind of tied here, <clears throat> right? No, that's over my, how... I don't understand how it's in, in, in what way has it inspired the, um, um, yeah. Well, the, the Memex, for example, has inspired a bunch of projects called Memex. So here's inspired by the Memex. Well, here's that I a, understand. That, that kind of makes sense to me. 
Cool. The, um... And Doug Engelbart's thing, we're actually using right this minute. So that one's pretty clear too, right? Right. Yeah, that's clear. It was the um, the Buddhist well, in, one. <laughs> yeah. So so in in so Indra's net, um, and similar for the glass bead game, which is uh, Herman Hesse's. I think I've got it here. Glass glass Berlinspiel, glass Berlinspiel, the, the glass bead game, um, which is a book by Herman Hesse, where these people play a game about knowledge, about you know everything that's known. And I, I I've not read the whole book. But here is a, somebody's post from a while ago comparing Indra's net with the glass bead game and others. And let me just go to this website and see who wrote this because I didn't put an author down here. And this message is gone. I think it was a message from a mailing list. Too bad it's gone. Uh, copy archive.org. Let's see if the Wayback Machine can cough it up for us. Ooh, have, you ever used the Wayback, have you ever used the Wayback Machine? No, that yeah. looks very cool okay so you just go to the internet archive uh you know archive.org in the middle of the screen is the wayback machine you put in a url that you know was a good url way back when and what it does is it coughs up this lovely screen that says hey i saved this thing 13 times between 2001 and 2004 and then it went away so th this website whatever it is went away at that point so what i can do is i can say show me from 2004, here's 2004. They 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 crawled this website at 10:42:14 in the morning on March 1st, and then again at uh, four uh, four o'clock on April 11th, 2004. If I click on that snapshot, the archive will go back and find what it found. That is so cool. Is this not shocking and cool? That is so, wonderful. So what I can do is I can copy this link actually. Um, yeah, I'll just I'll just overwrite this link with it. So edit location. I'm just going to paste in now the new archive link because this will last. This one's going to be pretty pretty durable. So I've just replaced the broken link with the archive link, and this was a message by Charles Cameron or Hip Bone at Earthlink, and I don't remember a Charles Cameron, but I'm going to just copy this person's name and credit them in my brain. Uh, in fact, I have Charles Hip Bone Cameron who worked at Skoll. So here's Charles Cameron. How about that? He studied under Chongyam Rinpoche uh, and Trevor Huddleston. He was at the Arlington Institute. He studied under Wallace Black Elk, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And he wrote a piece comparing, he wrote just an email message that I saved back in the day and I saved it in 2004. So that's when I put this message in my brain. And I don't know that there's tremendous uh, profundity here, but, uh, and what I could also do, by the way, I could just copy this and I could paste it. So here's um, what I can do just to be a little safer is take, the, oh, it's a long message, is basically go all the way down, uh, hit copy, well, come just... back over to my brain and paste it. There. So now, so now the full text of this email, I've just copied into the notes field of my brain. No big deal. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I'm just looking because I don't know that he's the one that did the comparison. I think he's talking, uh, I, I couldn't read it quickly enough, but I think somebody else is making. So I think, so I think, I think he's commenting on somebody else who wrote, uh, so Ginny, Hen, Ginny Henny wrote this here. And then he's saying, hey, this struck, this, I'm struck by this particular phrase because it's almost identical to Herman Hess in, I see. in his okay, poem. So, so th there. this is a this is not this is not the full conversation, I think. This is just one piece of the back and forth. Um, and I don't know how much of how much good comparison is in here, but it was good enough that I went wanted to remember it. And, yeah. and we don't have time right now to go back into it. But but this is kind of a tiny, tiny example of what we're talking about anyway, right? About well, being able other, to, go ahead. I'm so sorry to do this to you. Oh, the go other, ahead. The other tiny example is that Jenny's not mentioned. Charles gets his name on the brain, but Jenny doesn't. <laughs> um, if I had quoted her original post, I probably would have put it uh, you know, on, on her. And no, I know I, I'm not. 
but that's also, why I said I hate to do this to you. <laughs> but but also, it's just a piece of cake to to do this. I'm going to add Ginny uh, to the brain as well because he's quoting her, and why not? I appreciate that. Uh, you're most welcome. It's 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 really easy and helps. So so what the heck? Um. Well, that was that was successful. If if not a little bit down the rabbit hole, but um, but I like that. Okay, so go ahead. No, I'm just reading. Okay, I thought you were gonna. Like, uh, I moved my lips when I. Read. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, have, I have I have an auctioneer's ears. <laughs> um. Okay, so. So partly I'm looking for a narrative arc that would explain why this is important, what it might do for us. I mean, you know, um, Well, it could help in collaboration to not keep reinventing the wheel. Yeah. Well, one of the um, one of Ev's principal motivations for shared notes is so that we don't all have to keep reinventing the wheel. So, cool. And I'm just going to put some bullets in the narrative arc, just out of order but we can make an order out of them because once once there's a once there's the story that makes sense i can record that right and what i'm looking for is what's a good what's a good story to um to tell to make these points um Hmm. I'm getting distracted because what I've been doing here a lot is um, I think a lot here, but I don't use the notes field very much. And the notes field is a lot like the subsidian document over here. So what if I use the brain. So for example, if I hit the little arrow thing over here, my notes field goes over to the right. I'm just going to play with this for a sec, just for grins to show you what I mean. Uh, so if I copy this, then I come back to the brain and paste it. I get a very similar document, don't I? Yeah. Except now it's in the brain. Um, but I really don't like using the brain in this orientation. I've just grown completely accustomed to using it in horizontal orientation like this, because I really like having the wide landscape of brain stuff. That just makes me really happy to have a lot of wide space up here. So that's kind of why I do that. And ironically, I have less wide space than I would in the other orientation because I'm always leaving a little bit of room over here for my browser because that's how I add links to my brain is I drag links out of the browser. I'm thinking though, if you had the notes, you know, if you were working with somebody else, mm -hmm. it might be helpful to them to have it the other way. Well, and then um, Jolt and other people would like to import my brain data in, into their tools, into other environments. And so, Let's pretend that there's some synchronization between my brain and this OG at this uh, GitHub based set of pages. Then it gets really interesting because all of a sudden my editing here could replicate back here. Or let's say the brain made it possible to plug any uh, document into this notes field so that what I'm editing right here would in fact be this GitHub page. I'd just be editing it from the brain. That'd be kind of cool. So I don't know. I'm, I'm wandering off into like the architecture of the shared memory thing. But 
but that's what I'm trying to build while I'm building the relate wiki. I'm trying to make sure that these things are roughly parallel so that we can then play with the parallelisms and see where the power is and I can fold stuff in with other people. Okay, so one of the really important things in the narrative arc has to be collaboration. I mean, it's essential. Right. And I have to illustrate the collaborations in some useful and fruitful way. Um, I have to preserve personal preferences and points of view. I have to favor or encourage crystallization of points of view. Uh, by which that's kind of a word I've been using to say one future for this OGM relate shared memory is that everybody, all <clears throat> 7 billion people on earth create their own map of what they know and what they see. And then it's just chaos out there because then we have all these maps and nobody, you know, nobody finds anybody else's and it's just a mess. So when I find Pete Kaminsky's view on Markdown, and I really like it, I can say, oh, everything Pete just wrote applies for me. I'm just going to refer to Pete's nice, juicy piece that has loose boundaries around it, around this topic, around building a wiki on markdown files. That what, he, what he's doing there works for me. And then if a whole bunch of other people agree with that, then we've crystallized. And instead of each of us writing, well, and then you use markdown, and then you we don't need to do that. We just point into each other's bodies where we like their the other people's opinions or writing or perspective. So, so for me, the vision video has to incur has to include some example of that happening. Right? Does that make sense? Oh yeah. Cool. And I, I to me that sounds really important because um, I'm I'm not trying to say. It's really easy to interpret some of this as being, well, everybody should just do more critical thinking and take notes in conversations. Why isn't everybody doing critical thinking? Why aren't we teaching our kids critical thinking? And that's kind of a force in the background, but I'm not trying to finger wag and say everybody should do critical thinking. I'm trying to say if a few of us were thinking together better, the rest of us could benefit, just like a few people being a manic obsessive about maintaining Wikipedia helps everybody else, right? Because a whole bunch of billions of people who don't do anything to maintain Wikipedia benefit from Wikipedia on the planet. And I think I can comfortably say billions. I'm, I'm, I'm relatively sure because half the planet is online. That's 3 billion, let's call it. Of those 3 billion, I'm willing to bet more than half have used Wikipedia in their language. Um, maybe I'm stretching it, but boy, I, I, bet it's, I bet it's over a billion unique humans have actually touched Wikipedia, which is crazy. Will the vision help reach across disciplines? Uh, hopefully, yes. I mean, I mean, so that's where I the mean, narrative is that arc- something you want to include? Yes. Yes. I usually give my statements in the form of a question. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting tactic. The Jeopardy <laughs> approach. Oh, yeah, yeah. The answer is? I'll take mosaics for 500, please. Um. Cool. Um, so another piece, another piece of this is governance. Um, another piece of this is um,
And, and I want to avoid turning this video into a business plan. But I want to mention how these things might happen, you know, and Wikipedia, for example, lives off donations. And there's a whole bunch of people who <clears throat> donate money to keep Wikipedia going every year. Um, Mozilla, the browser company, they struck a really juicy, sweet deal early on, I think, with Google, where Google sends them money every year for making Google the default search engine on Mozilla long ago. And Mozilla has lost almost all its market share. Chrome, ironically, Google's own browser is the monster uh, in the browser business. But Mozilla has delicious funding because, because I think Google, um, I, and I, I should look into that, I should fact check it, but, uh, but that's different. Um, and then Craigslist, Early on, Craig decided to make everything free except a few things. So real estate listings and job listings are paid by real, real estate companies and employers. And there's maybe one or two other categories. Everything else happens on Craigslist for free, which with no ads, with no cookies on your machine, with no invasion of privacy, nada, none of that. Um, Craigslist is also very mean about screen scraping, so they don't, they don't want any third party sucking up all the Craigslist entries and reposting them somewhere else with ads or with whatever else. So, which, which is, and then they've also not modernized. So it kind of curtails a lot of stuff that could happen, but, but it's a really interesting financing model, which I love. Uh, and then I, you might've heard me tell the story about Brewster Kale who invented Alexa internet, which he sold to AOL, no, sold to Amazon. Um, and Alexa was a tool belt early in the day, in the early days of the internet. And the tool belt was a little browser attachment. And this little thing you, this little belt you attached to your browser would tell you as you were visiting websites, it would say, this website has this much traffic every day or month or year. Uh, it looks secure. It's owned by these people. I don't know what else it did. It would tell you about whatever websites you were visiting. And in doing so, it was busy collecting data about visitors and collecting traffic information. So it was kind of useful data. He sells this thing to Amazon. And as part of his deal, selling it to them says, for some amount of time, you have to contribute the data to this new thing I'm starting called the Internet Archive, which is a completely brilliant, just a just a, an astonishing, brilliant act of jujitsu <clears throat> to basically bootstrap the Internet Archive. Yeah. And the reason that Alexa, in, that the Alexa assistant at, at Amazon is called Alexa is because they bought his company called Alexa Internet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, there's a whole bunch. And, and Brewster for me is Interesting little tidbit. In 200 years from now, we're going to look back and, and think of Brewster as this era's Ben Franklin. I am quite quite convinced he's just a generous genius. See, that was a brain drop without the brain. I know, exactly. And I've got all those things in my brain, by the way. Of course. <laughs> uh, so, so I could have told that story while showing the brain box. Um, okay. We need more story, less analysis, and less facts. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm heading back into the dry stuff instead of the exciting stuff. Um, and there's also a ton of other stuff I need to upgrade here on the website. I need to like fix a whole bunch of other things and and keep going. So here, you know, here's the projects page. I was doing something, <clears throat> did I do this? Yes, you might like this. Um, so I, I've created a page called Relate Projects, clear enough. Uh, more than half of these I haven't even created the page for. So we were just on the Relate Vision video page. The, the other one, tiles you've seen. So this one you're familiar with, right? Uh, and then I added a tile this morning, this one, which I'm not done writing, but this is the one, two, four, all uh, Zoom app. I guess I need to call it the Zoom app. 
because I think zaps, I think they're not saying zaps. Uh, yes, update. There we go. Um, have you heard me talk about one, two, four, all before? I did. And remember, I said I prefer one, three, five, nine. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Stand by that. <laughs> yeah, good. Um, so I'm trying to describe this project here, and this would actually be um, a tile, uh, which means I need to rename this to tile dash one, two, four, all. And good. So what liberating structures is an actual project? Yes, Liberating Structures is a website that's done, uh, which I um, think looks like this. <clears throat> and here's a book, The Surprising Power of Liberating Structures, and they have a pattern language of uh, click on any liberating structure below. So here's the menu. Here's one, two, four, all. Here's Triz, Shift and Share, Helping Heuristics, Design Storyboards, Generative Relationships, Critical Uncertainties, Integrated Autonomy, Heard, Seen, Respected. These are all patterns for uh, collective thinking. And so if I go to one, two, four, all, it does this, and it explains how to do this process. You know, what materials do you need? How does this all work? Why do you do it? Tips and traps. This is really great. Uh, there was a video apparently that's not visible right now, uh, but this is all done. This is a very nice pattern language that was created by a bunch of people, some of whom are friends of mine. I think Nancy White, you've seen, she's in this crowd. Um, so I'm just picking this as one example for grins because it's really easy for me to illustrate. Wouldn't it be cool if this was actually also some software? Got it. And I'm I'm trying to use this an ex as an example of what I think I'm calling instrumenting wisdom. Uh, if somebody comes up with a better phrase, I would be thrilled. Uh, but what I mean is, there's a whole bunch of distilled wisdom out there. Some of which, some of which, maybe it's only a little bit of which, but some of which would make good code uh, and be more useful as good code. So why don't we do that? Why don't we turn it into good code that's openly available? So that's for me uh, a tile. And, and I, I got a little distracted here because I was actually trying to head back to the projects. So turbocharging pattern languages is this. And I'm realizing right this minute, what I need to do is go to the, to the tile. Um, So there's a couple steps of what I'm thinking about here. Um, <clears throat> um, And so I need to go back. Um, see, and then I need to go to tile one, two, four, all. <clears throat> I'm starting to learn how to do this. So I make a double link. I don't want that page, but I want other pages named tile one, two, four, all zoom app. There. So now I've made a link between this page, which is generally about 
a larger project called Turbocharging Pattern Languages, which points to a tile of the one, two, four, all Zoom app. And then the tile is just a one particular example of, hey, let's go do this everywhere all at once. So lather, rinse, repeat. <clears throat> uh, that something like that. Okay, so I got a little distracted from the vision video, <laughs> but 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 this is a piece of what sort of I want. I'm trying to articulate in the vision video. Huh. So here's the vision video again. Um, and I'm happily getting more comfortable in, in Obsidian. And I'm sure that I'm sure that shortly uh, Pete will try to convince me to shift to a different tool <laughs> because that's how he rolls. It's like, Jerry, you should probably be using Adam instead. I'm like, wait a minute. Well, do you know what I found out today? No, what? Well, you you probably, I mean, you probably know of something called Matrix, which uh, is yes. totally, I have no idea what that is. But what I did find out is that they have a bridge from Discord to Mattermost. Oh. I was very excited about that. Well, I think, but I think Matrix is all about the bridges. I think Matrix, for example, also, also lets you hook into Mastodon. Uh, and know. a couple other things. So I've got it here under uh, potential OGM architecture components, OGM neighbor communities, decentralized conversation stores, et cetera. And there's an article written for open source alternatives to Slack. Well, I just know from what I see and where I am that having that connector between Discord and Mattermost, I think is gonna be really important to at least the OGME meta project type things yes agreed there is the thing called riot which i think is like discord but i'm not sure let's see what riot says to us oh man i never want to try another thing <laughs> i know i know i know there's just too many of these secure and independent communication connected via matrix this is just personal enterprise collaboration see Vibrant communities, matrix services, built on matrix, governed by the matrix foundation, the matrix protocol. That was the name of the first company I worked for, by the way. The matrix? Matrix, yeah. Matrix instruments. Oh, ah, cool. Very cool. Uh, located where? Orangeburg, New York. Go Orangeburg. Um, Okay, anything else we should think about on the vision video? Any other thoughts, ideas? Just the store, I, I, yeah. So I kind of want to add a survey of other vision videos. I want to say a little bit like, hey, historically, there have been a bunch of ways of illustrating project visions that are pretty fruitful. Um, so let's do that for us. And also, let's do it in a way that uses our tools. So it's woven, linky, shared, whatever that means. So, um, and here I'm thinking about, I'm thinking a little bit about the stories I told around the global financial crisis. Um, did I send you those? Did we talk about those? Uh, nothing's coming to mind. All right, I'm, I'll give you a refresher. Um, 2008 financial crisis, <clears throat> foreclosures, effects, boom, boom, boom. 
um, here's the GFC, the global financial crisis of 2007-2008. I created a bunch of videos around it. Uh, causes, effects, where is it? World collapse, the economic crisis. Oh, this is very strange. So it's called SNP. There we go. SNP in finance playlist. My YouTube playlist, my brain casts. So this should be connected to causes of the global financial crisis. Now it will show up there. Much better. <clears throat> I will send you this link, okay. which is three videos. Um, and um, I'm and, and just for a taste, but what I do in these videos is uh, so, for example, here's um, here's this, this kind of the the hub. Uh, so, here, oh, okay, so here's causes of the global financial crisis. So, why was that not showing up? where we just were, because I wasn't looking for purple. That's why. Okay, I was looking for YouTube videos. So here is a piece of my narrative around the global financial crisis. I'm like, hey, we snipped all these long-term relationships that used to hold things together in finance, like George Bailey at, what was, this, what was the name of the city in It's a Wonderful Life? Bakers, Bakersville? Bakers? Potters, Pottersville. Pottersville. Um, uh, it's a wonderful life, George Bailey, <clears throat> it's a wonderful life, Pottersville is the, our town, I need to put this under fictitious, oh, I know what's it, fictitious uh, cities, places. Fiction. Fictional imaginary places. And Bedford Falls is what it actually is, right? And in the, in, the dy in the dystopian future, it becomes Pottersville because Potter owns everything. But really it's Bedford Falls and George Bailey lives in Bedford Falls. So I'll make that connection. Okay, how did I get so far afield? Um, oh, Financial I know. Crisis. So what I was saying was, lenders used to know their clients personally and hold the loans to maturity. So that's my statement here. Totally non-controversial statement, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm going to color it yellow to make it stand out more. Um, and then what we did was we basically broke up the whole mortgage chain so that you have mortgage loan originators whose jo only job, we have realtors who just find you a place. We have loan originators who just make a loan and then sell it off immediately. And then even the loan holders dice, slice and dice the loans. And then we put little bits and pieces of them in these really complicated securities that were too complicated to understand. So I go through all of that in those videos, probably not as clearly as I just did. Um, but, but what I'm trying to say is, given the limited resources I had in the brain, I'm trying to tell the story by clicking on the relevant thoughts in the brain as I go through each of the points I'm trying to make. And at each point, you can see evidence of what I mean. So this is uh, this is directly under the, the definition for mortgage and the Wikipedia page for mortgages. It's under lending, but it's also under George Bailey and the movie It's a Wonderful Life, right? Because everybody, because lots of people understand George Bailey was this wonderful banker who knew his clients and gave them some slack when they had trouble, et cetera, et cetera. So, so that's a known thing. So how do we tell the relate slash OGM vision video um, how do we tell this story in a way that lets us make a bunch of stops in different places there's probably a different um, there's a slightly more disaggregated uh, Trump field manual I'm probably going to have to do an update for this one uh, here's a field manual for dealing with Donald Trump. This is a playlist. Uh, let me give you this link 
in my brain so you can actually um, see how they're structured. So I did a bunch of videos. I did, I did, I actually did six. I never finished all eight videos. Uh, I had seven and eight as titles, but I never actually recorded those. And I would do, I think I'm overdue for finishing seven and eight maybe now uh, as what the hell to do because you might still, you know, uh, let me, uh, so will Trump 2024 is a thought in my brain. Will Trump run in 2024, right? Um, that's a really important question in the world of U.S. politics right now. Um, but I made a bunch of videos uh, that started with, he's smarter than we think he is, and then went to what, it, what are his strategies and what does he do? And then at each point, I point I, the points I make in the video I have here. So uh, Trump made himself a caricature of the greedy billionaire, stranger than Thurston Howell III and Gilligan's Island. And here's Thurston Howell the third, and here's Gilligan's Island, right? Did you um do you have the one where um a man by the name of Trump comes into town? It was one of those old Western sitcoms, not sitcom, one of those Western series from like probably 1960. I don't know if it was Ponderosa, not Ponderosa. <sighs> Watch a 1950s villain, villain named Trump try to con That's people. It. Yes. It. This Wyoming town, nope. Uh, 1950s I actually saw Western. That. Yeah. In Florida, they show on free TV, they show all this old stuff, which is awful. And that episode was actually on. And I was just shocked. The, the 1950s TV series Track Down Walter Trump, who would build a wall. No, I don't remember a wall. That's not it? It was that one. This one. It's tracked down. Oh, that is it. Yeah, that it seems the old show tracked down perfectly predicted a moment. So I don't think I have tracked down. Thank you. Oh, here we go. Look, look, look. I've heard this before. A 1950 show had a fear-mongering con man named Trump who wanted to build a wall. And I don't have this connected to Trump really much. Wait a minute. I have it connected to the shutdown. Wow. Thank you. So You're this welcome. is this is connected to Trump. Here, year two of the Trump administration. Uh, Trump threatens government shutdown if wall not funded, blah, blah, blah. Uh, build a big, beautiful wall. So, and have Mexico pay for it. I have that, you know, Trump's platform. All of which is under backlash against multiculturalism. But thank you for that. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Here's track down. Now what I'll do is I will add this article from Mashable to the same spot in my brain. Here we go. Done. Marcus Gilmer. Oh, Robert Culp. I didn't realize he was in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing, no? You can't make this stuff up. You can't make this shit up. It's true. It's just shocking. All right. Um, so I showed you all those things because I think I'd like to make the vision video, I'd like to deconstruct it into nuggets that play as a small sequence so that each nugget is short. The reason I did a bunch of short Trump videos is that before the one week before the election, I made a long Trump video and it was pretty long. Um, and I was like, you know what? People don't like watching long stuff. They like watching short stuff. Uh, and so, after the election, I did a bunch of soul searching and thinking, and I came up with those six videos, which I then recorded separately. And it was really important to the structure of it that I was modularizing the ideas, and that all fits my nuggets with narratives and points of view uh, kind of thing, which is, what's a nugget? How do we make narratives out of individual nuggets? How do we string them together to, to build a narrative? How do narratives stack up to build a point of view? Does that ring a bell? 
I'm thinking about something else because now something's making sense for me and I was having, it, it wasn't clicking in for me. I, I, I wasn't getting the relationship to the Trump videos and the narrative that, and the, the, the video you're trying to create. Yeah. And now, is, it, is it better now? Well, if, if this is, I don't know if it's better. I, I know what, what clicked in for me is, oh, this could be really great because you could take bits and pieces from other people's videos and put them together right. as your whole story. So yeah. if that's the goal, then yes, now it clicks in. <laughs> yep. Uh, yes, exactly. So I'm making links here to the video the video series i've i've created that be that behave this way the nuggets narratives and points of view thing and that huh. would be amazing to have a tool to do that like when we when we say like what would an average person want and i'm yeah. your average person if i had something that i could go around and take two piece you know two minutes from this thing and two minutes from that that would be my dream so there was a tool long ago, I think it was called Crayon. It went away and I've never been able to find it again. It was a collaborative video editing website. And it was like, have you ever used video editing software on your desktop? Jerry, either you or I froze. Oh, uh, I don't know who it I'm was. still I'm still seeing you. It's not different for me. Are you am I no, still? No, I mean glitch. Not no, now I could hear you, but okay. Uh, so did you hear what I said? I heard the last part, which is, did I ever use a video software, uh, video, video editing thing? Video editing. Just, just, I just saw you do Descript. Well, you know, just that little oh, okay. taste. Okay, good. So, so this thing, I, which I think was called Crayon, had a timeline, except you could then, you could then, with other people, put in suggestions for what to put where, and then each person could create their version of the video you were making. Because I could say, ooh, I really like this one, but not this one. Show this one, but that one, blah, 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 blah. It was very simple and made a lot of sense. And then it disappeared. I think it got, I think they got flooded by lawyers. What was, uh, what was the name of that tool? I thought it was called Crayon. Um, uh, but I don't think I've got it properly here because it's not this one. Composite Web Page Services Net Presence CEO Express. I don't think it was this. No, this is a subscribing to columnist crayon. Uh, or maybe it was something with an M. Huh. Crayon initiative. Recycling crayons. Nope, that's not it for sure. Um, anyway, I, I looked for it years ago after it had disappeared and I wasn't able to relocate it. That's a shame. And, and it's that a shame. Helpful to us right now. And at one point, the creator had written a note saying, I'm, I'm stopping this project because I don't have resources for it. If anybody wants the code, you know, I'll release it into open source. And I, I remember reading that. And then, and then, it, and then next time I checked, all of it was gone. So, yeah. <clears throat> so anyway, all right. So th this has been a really good kickstart. I'm thinking, I'm thinking we stop the, the office hours call. Um, I'll stop the share and stop. stop. The recording. Oh, wait, call. wait, don't stop the recording yet. Okay, if, tell me more. If, if any of you viewers out there have some ideas that you want to add, <laughs> please put your ideas in the Mattermost channel. <laughs> Sounds great. Thank you. That's our csc.collectivesensecommons.com. Is that right? It's one of those. Uh, Yes, collectivesensecommons.org. How about that? Chat.collectivesensecommons.org is where the channel exists. Uh, we can figure it out from there. Sweet. Let me turn off the...